Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar, Auditor's webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking about empowering better decisions, harnessing data for process optimization and emission reduction. Uh, and without further ado, we will get into um, to our slides. We'll explain a bit of the process as we go. Um, Today I'll uh, be hosting it and I'm the, the Director of Modular Integrated System with Hydro Terra and we have Richard Bryce with us as well from CMP Consulting Group in Melbourne. Um, Richard, he tells me now that he actually has not 20, 24 years um, over, over a number of countries and he specialises, his skill set is in design operation, optimization, asset management uh, including condition capacity, resilience, performance assessment, development of business cases, and all biological processes for wastewater treatment and reuse. He also has experience with potable water reuse, recycling water and desalination plants. And he's asking me not to read it all. If, uh, so if, if you have a bit of a dive through that, you'll see the rest of his um, experience. Again, uh, those who have uh, been on those webinars before, if you have any uh, questions, there's a Q and A at the, uh, at the top there and you can register your questions. Um, we also have a couple of early bird questions that have come through. So at the end of this, uh, at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll, uh, we'll run through those. And if we don't get through them and there's, and uh, we, we're still trying to uh, get back to people with some of those answers as well. Why do Hydro Terra run these webinars? Uh, well, um, we've outlined our three key principles of why we do that. So to share knowledge of HydroTerra's specialist monitoring supplies and connection to ensure clients and colleagues are updated with the latest environmental monitoring methodologies and technology. We'd like to facilitate education of HydroTerra's clients and colleagues to allow appropriate adoption of our technologies in the future. And lead industry by understanding the needs of industry um, as well. So we look forward to uh, hearing from anyone through our Q&A. Um, at the end of the webinar. So without um, too much uh, further, I'll hand over to Richard um, and and uh, and let him introduce, introduce uh, his topic and run through that. And he'll just give me a, a cue to continue slides as we go. Right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. Um, look, I would like to begin with acknowledgement of traditional owners and, and I guess we're all on different lands. Um, so I will go through a little bit um, more um, in terms of uh, an acknowledgement um, and, and introduce myself um, and my background being from Aotearoa, New Zealand as well. Um, a lot of the work that I will be talking about will be around how we can practically uh, integrate with traditional owners and some of the benefits um, that I have had in my career as well. So thanks, Steve. Um, so, ko Taranaki Tokumonga, ko Oyo Toku Awa, no Nam Aho, ko Richard Bryce Toku Ngoa. So, my my mountain, my manga is Taranaki. That's the picture there. My river is Oyo. Um, I'm from Melbourne. Um, well, I live in Melbourne now. Um, obviously, I'm not from Melbourne. Um, and my name is Richard Bryce. <laughs> so, uh. A lot of the work I do and why I got into to this this field was to try and make a difference and um, to the environment. And um, I've been blessed to have worked with uh, a lot of iwi groups in Aotearoa um, and learnt a lot. And um, yeah, I have to say I really appreciate the connection to land uh, and the the, uh, the spirituality around water. So yeah, um, I'm a process engineer. Obviously, I've done a lot of licensing. Um, I've got a passion for digital and carbon and smart procurement. Um, I'm also on the board of ICME in Australia uh, as the technical policy advisor to uh, for uh, federal policy. Um, I'm on the sustainability hub and I'm a dad and a husband. Um, I like to travel and I like to play sport and read. And um, being a Kiwi, I'm watching a lot of the Rugby World Cup at the moment. Thanks, Steve. So I um, wanted to talk through... I guess the environmental and public health protection elements of, of what we do. Um, 
linking that to processes and, and dis discharge license requirements. And we're, we're all about general environmental duty um, in Victoria in particular, but understanding those linkages, uh, be that around uh, emissions and process emissions. And then given we're going to get all of this information and we wanted to get better information, what can we do with it? And how do we harness uh, that information to make better decisions um, and uh, save save money and, and optimize our processes, be that for nutrient removal, be that for process emissions um, or, or for compliance. So thanks, Steve. So um, I'm a big fan of little segue topics. So this is a standard product uh, booster pump station. So when I talk about being smarter digitally and smarter from a procurement perspective, this is all about um, providing a smart digital asset um, that can be fabricated in a factory, delivered to site and plugged in, um, and all to client specifications or owner specifications uh, as well. So why do we treat wastewater? What do we need to worry about? So um, thanks, Steve. Um, so I, I, I'm, I like a bit of history. So um, Thucydides uh, was a, an Athenian general and historian. Um, so he, he wrote an account on a plague in Athens around the Peloponnese uh, War when they were fighting the Spartans for dominance over, over the uh, ancient areas around Greece. Um, so long, long, long history of understanding uh, epidemics around public health. Um, and interrelationships with water. Um, so you all have heard of the American Public Health, APHA, standard uh, methods. Um, so that, that started sort of in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then the first activated sludge plant was uh, was built in 1913 in Manchester in Davy Hume. So I was um, lucky to be uh, around for the latest upgrade of that um, a few years ago. Um, still to this day, we have reported outbreaks of cholera. So, um, so, and where I come from in Aotearoa, was, there's still a lot of waterways that are not clean to swim in. Uh, we have had a, uh, a public health disaster, for want of a better term, in 2014, 2015, where a, a number of people died um, through ingestion of uh of water that was polluted um, through a uh, groundwater um, bore um, and a town of about 5,000 people, pretty much the entire town got sick, including some of my relations. Um, so we need to do better um, is probably the, some of the messages from that um, and um, aligning that to sustainable development goals as well. Um, it's not just in Aotearoa, it's um, we need to provide clean water and sanitation uh, to a lot more people in the world. Thanks, Steve. So when we look at what we want to sample for and, and why, and um, it, it, all of this will come back to um, to uh, public health and environmental, better environmental outcomes. So. We're looking at um, water and wastewater. So wastewater treatment uh, plants, we've got domestic wastewater, we've got industrial wastewaters. Um, you might have combined sewers, probably more like Tasmania, I think only in Australia, um, but certainly in the UK and other parts of the world, a lot of combined sewers. Um, so we discharge that into the into a receiving environment, uh, either land or, or to water. So from a health risk perspective, we're concerned about uh, pathogens and and uh, and nutrients and um, and also, you know, uh, creating, putting solids into a waterway, uh, metals, and then uh, I said emerging contaminants there, but really a lot of these contaminants have emerged now. So um, we're talking around PFAS, dioxins, uh, personal care products, et cetera. Um, so I did a, uh, I did a study uh, in early 2000s looking at endocrine disruptors and virus removal through MBRs. And I think it was a, a plant downstream in the Mississippi River where they'd sampled for uh, caffeine about 17 kilometres downstream of a plant. You could still measure caffeine levels. So... I imagine in Melbourne that's pretty horrendous, um, given how much caffeine we chop down here. So, um, also looking at other things, so return to the environment, noise, dust, airborne pollution, um, 
So the other part now that we're really seeing a lot more uh, on is uh, is greenhouse gas emissions and how how do we um, monitor for greenhouse gas emissions in a treatment plant. Um, so uh, I think we are three percent of global emissions, and twenty five percent comes from wastewater treatment of that three percent um, as well. So nitrous oxide, methane, um, etc. So thanks, Sue. In terms of risk frameworks, so you'll see from an environmental perspective, we're looking at uh, cultural values. Um, so what are the aspirations of the community um, and our traditional owners? Um, one of the big uh, lessons I've learned through working with iwi groups in Aotearoa, um, and it's starting to happen here now, which is great, uh, is the, the value of, of uh, the local um, iwi groups in Aotearoa on on the uh, on the local waterways, but also stories of past. So past, present, and future is such a great uh, way to encapsulate uh, water management as well. Um, so we're looking at things like fish species that we used to have. Um, did a project in uh, in Victoria, and there was an abalone species that has been extinct um, now with middens, etc., for for many many years. So, how do we recreate or look to a recreate an environment where where um, we're we're going back to um, past before we we came along and damaged everything? So, ecological impacts. Um, what what do we need to to measure for in the receiving environment around the ecological impacts? Ammonia, um, nutrients to stop uh, algal blooms, etc. Uh, killing fish, um, getting PFAS into into livers liver of of fish, for example, when we're when we're taking fish um, from a receiving environment. So pathogen levels. So all of these things are important from a uh, a risk assessment perspective, and then when we can look at, uh, do we monitor more monitoring plans? Do we look at what treatment systems that we need to uh, to enable risk mitigation or to reduce the impact we're having in the environment? Or can we look at uh, using some of the water we're producing to grow trees and plants and, and look at planting out um, waterways? So, um, again, uh, I'm not sure what it's like in, in other parts of Australia, but certainly... Um, in, in New Zealand, you, you have to fence off your waterways. So it's an opportunity to work with traditional owners and, and create some offsets and stop stock getting into, into waterways um, to clean up an environment. Um, we have limits on technology and treatment plants. Um, and there's, there's this, this beautiful balancing act between treating to the nth degree and the amount of power and greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, that we have to create to treat to that level um, as well. So. Um, thanks, Steve. So what do we need for each process? So if we're going to monitor, what do we need to understand? So um, I like this little pathway diagram around uh, phosphorus removal and the and the, the bug uptake. And it sort of reminds me a bit of myself when I, when I get into an environment that I'm not happy in, I, I release all my stress and and uh, then I get into an environment that I'm too happy and I probably eat a little bit too much and take too much back into my cells so I get a little bit oh a bit fat so um, and that's sort of the biological phosphorus removal process so what do we need to know for each process and what what monitoring do we need to do um, to understand a our effect on the environment b the performance of a treatment plant asset c what treatment plant we need to have and D, how do we make the process that we've got work better? Um, and also, obviously, from our process emissions perspective. Thanks, Steve. We need to understand flow. So fundamentally, without understanding what flow we have coming into a plant, um, we struggle to start um, doing anything. And um, this is something that uh, it, it's really important to audit uh, what's coming into a process to understand um, not just uh, the installation of, of metering equipment, but also the, the data transfers and making sure that we're getting uh, information out uh, that is, is reasonable and accurate. Um, if without these fundamental data points, you, you, you're never going to get anywhere. So um, 
a lot of our units we need um, from a treatment plant design perspective. We want, might want some hourly flows. We might want instantaneous flows. We need to understand our diurnal flow profiles. We need to understand how flows have been conveyed to the treatment plant as well. So um, really, really important to make sure that that is right and audited and auditable. So um, I've seen a lot of plants uh, where the flow meters aren't installed properly um, and they're not not reading properly as well. So I uh, cannot recommend enough making sure that that's robust data. Thanks, Steve. So just some basic biology. So carbon. So um, carbon is used by biomass to make cells and, and aerobically or anaerobically, we emit CO2 or methane if we're anaerobic. Nitrogen, um, so nitrogen is, is a key uh, nutrient that's used in cell growth. Um, so, and again, the pathway for nitrogen removal is in the gas phase. So in a treatment plant, so we're looking at um, a pathway for our greenhouse gas emissions here. And also obviously methane um, as well as another um, key greenhouse gas emission uh, element. So. Phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, the only way of getting rid of phosphorus is within our biosolids. So um, that's the pathway for getting rid of solids. So, um, and if we've got biological pea removal, um, again, we need some some good information around whether or not we can actually achieve bio pea removal. Um, but it, you could find somewhere between two and a half percent normally and about 12% if you've got bio pea of, of phosphorus in your sludge or in your biosolids. Uh, other things that we might have and we might not, uh, we might be missing calcium, magnesium, other other sort of micronutrients. So that's really, really relevant for things where we might have, you know, we might be treating waste from a, a um, chocolate factory, for example, um, where, we, um, where we're missing certain micronutrients uh, or you've got an abattoir where you've got lots and lots of nitrogen and not a lot of carbon. So we want to start to look at balancing our biology or about balancing our, um, our mass of, of nutrient flows into, this, into the plant so we can grow bugs to do their thing. Thanks, Steve. So once we've got our flows right, we need to do some sampling, right? So, um, so what are we looking for? Again, as I said, bacteria grow more bacteria, um, and they use uh, organic contaminants, oxygen, nutrients to grow more cells um, effectively, and and to keep things in uh, in an equilibrium. We waste we waste sludge, hence the phosphorus removal. So, need to really understand our catchment. So. Uh, again, um, sampling, online analysis, uh, these things make a massive difference in terms of your ability to treat wastewater. They make a huge difference in terms of um, risk profile on a treatment plant. Um, and often your operators will be able to tell you what's going on in the plant more so than anyone else. So um, providing due respect and asking questions of operations staff is really important. So um other things you might look at might be um, septic tank trucks. Uh, so looking at mass of, of screenings taken out, stuff that's toxic to wastewater, uh, cleaning chemicals, so wash downs. One of my first jobs when I was a um, young warthog graduate uh, was looking at uh, the Auckland uh, wastewater treatment plant, which was then converted from a massive lagoon system, I think the biggest in the world, to an activated sludge plant. And we'd had um, 20 days before Christmas where they took hourly samples and put them in a freezer. And I ran a, uh, I ran an, um, a reactor trial for, uh, for um for toxicity and and measuring toxicity effects on on potential the potential toxicity effects of the uh, washdowns over Christmas time on uh, on the biology that was going to be um, in the nutrient plant. So again, really important to understand what you're trying to sample for, and trying to get these things in a balance um, as well. So you don't end up with adding more chemicals to try and remove your nitrogen, for example. Um, so thanks, Steve. So back to fundamentals. So 
the whole process of an activated sludge plant is um, was developed really to separate your solids residence time from your hydraulic residence time. So um, as the most simple form of um, an explanation. So uh, you'll see that you've got a, a, a tank where you've got a reactor tank. Now that might be air on, air off, uh, anaerobic, anoxic, um, et cetera. You've got some form of solids liquid separation system a recycle for those solids that you're taking out in that solids liquid separation system that might be a clarifier, it might be membranes, and then you waste sludge. So you're keeping the biomass in an equilibrium, that growth cycle um, in an equilibrium by wasting sludge. So you'll always see an aeration tank of some form. Um, you'll always see some form of solids liquid separation. You'll always see a uh, waste activated sludge and you will always see a return activated sludge line. So must have screening, good screening, uh, good grit removal, um, some solids processing, assessing and dewatering. So people always forget and often treatment plants you'll go to, um, there'll be, everything will be schmick in terms of the liquid stream and then uh, people have forgotten about uh, the solar stream or you'll run out of money. So you'll have duty equipment only. It'll be undersized. Um, uh, and sometimes you'll see that there's a, a lack of uh, understanding on return loads. So um, a couple of big opportunities for performance uh, or understanding performance and optimization is around A, your aeration system, because that's going to be one of your biggest costs on a plant, but also in your dewatering and thickening systems. So again, another opportunity to monitor things in real life or in real time, sorry. Um, and, and also to look at uh, adding things like the words digital twin and, and measuring in real time the performance. Um, in treatment plants, you'll also find uh, generally, again, gross generalization, uh, that if you have a, a number of operators, there'll be an operator that might be on a dewatering system one week and then another operator on, a, on the dewatering system the next week. And they will both think they operate the treatment plant, the dewatering system as efficiently as humanly possible. I can guarantee you one of them probably will be and one of them probably isn't. So, um, but we, don't measure this and we don't measure our filtrate returns or centrate returns um, streams uh, and we don't do mass balances around these systems. So big cost items to run, um, a lot of chemicals often as well. And uh, now when we're talking about trucking biosolids off site uh, or having biosolids uh, sitting on site, um, big potential for greenhouse gas emissions uh, and, um, and also running around uh, environmental issues with uh, stockpiling of, of so solids. Thanks, Steve. Again, so um, as I said, you in a bigger plant, you might see primary sedimentation. Um, so pre that, you'll have your screen and grit system. So first opportunity for some flow and quality monitoring. Uh, so again, you've got to have a really good, robust understanding and an accurate understanding of what's coming into a plant. If you can see that, especially if you've got industrial uh, inputs, if you can see those industrial inputs coming in um, as well, it, it gives you an opportunity to respond to them. It also gives you an opportunity to understand what's happening on your plant. Let's say um, your night uh, ammonia numbers start going up. Um, what's that from? Is that is that some uh, something toxics come down the tube? Uh, your aeration all of a sudden has gone right up. Is that due to some heavy industrial load come down with lots of lots of COD demand or lots of nitrogen uh, coming through? So again, if you can look at your catchment and your treatment plants together um, and try and optimize those interfaces. Uh, it's a great enabler for saving money, saving stress, being compliant, um, uh, and having a really robust understanding of what's going on in your system. Liquor returns, as I was talking about before with the dewatering system. So um, 
you know, if you if you're if you've got that system optimized as much as possible, you're going to le at least massive solids and uh, coming back to the front end of your plant uh, uh, that you can. So it's it's not uh, taking away the capacity of the system to be able to treat what's coming into the plant. Um, again, understanding aeration and, and how much air flows. So normalizing that compensating for humidity and temperature um, really important to understand how much air you're actually putting into the system um, so also um, you'll see on the back end there I've got a little standard product uh, RDT system so that's that's again it's it's an example of procuring stuff a little bit smarter so uh, that's able to be put on the back of a truck uh, we've got some QR codes on there um, so those QR codes link to the O and M manual, uh, so the video to how to maintain that pump, and also has asset management data embedded into it. So you've got things like lifespan parts, part numbers, um, materials, um, different specifications that can be directly auto linked to. So if you're working in Maximo, your asset management system. So. Um, Little segue there, sorry. Um, but again, just just thinking about your assets when you're designing them or, or, or operating them and, and making sure that both the way you procure stuff and what you design and operate is being done as efficiently as humanly possible. Thanks, Steve. So what do we need? Because this goes back to, um, to the monitoring requirements and um, what you may or may not monitor for. So... If we're talking trying to get a mass balance together, uh, we can't use BOD. So you can't you can't do a mass balance. Uh, you can't work out how much air you need accurately. You can't work out how much solid you're going to create, and you cannot work out your effluent nutrient flows on a BOD basis. So you need to break this down into COD um, at fractions. So we have um, we have. Uh, the ability to take samples on, on our influent, we have the ability to measure online in real time um, and split those samples up into the different fractions. Now, they may be soluble, they may be uh, particulate fractions. Those fractions are going to behave very differently in a treatment plant. Some of them might be undegradable and soluble and pass all the way through the treatment plant. So, And that's important if you've got a tight nitrogen limit. So if you've got a couple of milligrams per litre of undegradable soluble nitrogen coming into your plant and you've got five milligrams per litre of total nitrogen as a licence compliance number, you've only got three milligrams per litre of total nitrogen in your ammonia, nitrite, nitrate uh, and anything solid coming out the back end to play with. So these, these numbers are really important, particularly with... Um, a driver now towards more strict discharge quality standards. Um, and I guess going back to the BOD, so we have, uh, what is it, BOD 5 is the five days to get down the Thames River, BOD 7 is the seven days to get down the River Seine, and 21 is a fjord in Norway, I believe. So um, the, the, um, the, 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 BOD can have, you could have a, two samples with exactly the same BOD, five, for example, but will do completely different things in your treatment plant. So going back to doing a proper fractionation and getting proper data, um, using automatic samplers, using online instruments um, is, is a massive way of A, optimizing and B, reducing the cost of your asset when you build it. So um, thanks, Steve. So once we've done all that sampling, what does it transfer to? So um, we've got our flows accurately. Uh, we understand what's coming into the plant. Uh, we have a, a fairly good handle on those fractions that's come, that are coming in. Uh, so what does that then give us? So when we do our mass balance and our design of the plant, we take those fractions and we work out what portion is gonna be active and then what's going to be basically solids, inerts, um, you know, might be chemical sludges, for example. So when you 
break that down, you might find that only 20, 25, maybe up to 30% of the biomass sitting in your reactor is actually doing anything. The rest of it's just floating around, um, particularly if you've got a long sludge age as well, that, that portion goes down. The other thing that's important to note is your autotrophs. So the things that remove nitrogen or the things that start your process for removing nitrogen are your autotrophs. And you might only have 50, 60 to 100 milligrams per liter of autotrophs in your, in your biomass. So really important to understand, A, how much you have there, what your inventory is, and to protect that inventory. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second when we talk more about optimization of your asset as well. Thanks, Steve. So some good rules of thumb. Now, I like, I like these. So when you've got data, um, don't always trust what comes through from the lab. So I'm hoping there's not too many people in the, from laboratories on, on the call. <laughs> I'm sure there probably is. But, um, you know, when you're taking samples, there's, there's chain of custody risks. There's, um, you know, sampling risks. Someone like me puts a wrong sample number or a wrong sample location on a bottle, sends it off to a lab. Um, at, or for some reason, the sample gets mixed up. So you can end up with some quite erroneous numbers. So again, going through and just taking those numbers and running some simple screening across those numbers, not only enables you to look at um, look at whether or not the, the information is accurate or not. So you can take those samples out of your, of your design or your optimization um, work, but also it can tell you a lot about what's going on in your plant. So if you've got high solids and high COD, you know, you've got lots of particulate material coming down. If you've got low solids and high COD, then you might have lots of degradable material coming down. So it's an enabler for more ph phosphorus or nitrogen removal, for example. So um, again, starting to look at that when you're doing the work on your plant. So uh, you can start thinking about what do you need to do to optimize the asset as much as you can. If you've got high COD to nitrogen ratios, and it's really degradable, you should be able to remove nitrogen down to pretty low levels if your plant's set up right. And if you're not, then then that's the time to start questioning things like your controllers and control of your plant, how much air you're putting in. Thanks, Steve. So um, when we start talking about process optimization, uh, what we're trying to do really is we're trying to short circuit our our nitrogen process so if you see in the middle there the in shunt process not nitrite shunt process sorry you'll see a um if there's a massive oxygen required to get you from ammonia through to nitrite and up to nitrate if you can short circuit that then you short circuit the amount of oxygen you need to input uh for for starters if you short circuit that on the other side when you go from your um, your nitrifying uh, biomass through to your denitrifying uh, biomass with your ordinary heterotrophs, so the the left hand side is that sixty to one hundred milligrams per liter. So the, the the left hand side of that graph, the AOBs, are the things that really grow slowly. So they're the things that you don't have many of that you've got to protect in your plant. On the right hand side, the things that do your denitrification. Uh, the other, the rest of your active biomass. So a lot more of those. Um, but if you can have those working as efficiently as possible and you're saving COD, you're saving oxygen, you're saving alkalinity. So lots and lots of benefits on, on the system. Um, and it, it may be that you're also saving the potential for a pathway for nitrous oxide um, uh, production as well. So from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. Thanks, Steve. So what what do we do? So if we've got our data, we know it's accurate. Uh, we've verified it because we've gone and measured our flow meters are reading, reading accurately. We've made sure that our data being transferred from our flow meters into a SCADA is accurate and reading accurately. We've done our sampling. We might have some online instruments. Then we've got a good chance of doing something on our plant. Um, the old saying is, particularly with models, rubbish in is rubbish out, right? So what we're trying to do with our models, and you'll see um, I've, I've put together a, a four-stage process. 
uh, there as a model. So that's that's uh, your first stage is is anoxic. Then you've got the aerobic tank. So you've got your diffusers in in that tank. You've got a recirculation line where you're bringing back the nitrate. You're producing your aerobic tank back to the front of the plant. So that's that nitrite or nitrate that short circuit setup potentially. Um, if you've got your plant set up correctly, and then your secondary anoxic zone where you're uh, creating nitrogen gas, hopefully, and then your second aeration zone just to top off your residual uh, ammonia, and then your RAS line and your WAS line, as, as we're talking about. So basically what we do is we take the, the plant data, um, we all that work that we've done in terms of flows and concentrations, the fractionation work. So we've we've taken our uh, we've taken our samples. We've taken them off to a lab. Um, we have put them through a um, GFC filter for our TSS and for our particulate COD uh, for our filtered COD. Sorry, and then we've put them through a 0.45 micron filter for our flocculated filter, filtered COD. Now degradable and undegradable soluble fractions. We set up our flow diagram and made sure the plant is set up right. Uh, we've set up all the tanks with the right dimensions and with the right amount of air in it. Um, we've set out our controllers to make sure that they're controlled properly um, as they are in the plant. And then we run the model and hope for the best. No, we run the model and we work through to try and match what's happening in the plant to real life. So our mass balance in theory, we should have the right amount of biomass in there. We should have the right amount of solids being wasted. We should have the right amount of air going into the plant and we should have the right discharge quality. And if all that works out and the, the stuff within your plant monitoring is working out, then you've started. So well done, Take, got, a, got ourselves a verified model. Now that calibration can be a lot more detailed than that, or it can be quite simple. It just depends on what you're trying to do. So then, then we talk through what are we trying to do to from an optimization perspective. So if you remember that that nitrogen graph, uh, whereby um, we're able to save quite a lot of oxygen by short circuiting that nitrogen pathway, and we were able to save quite a lot of degradable carbon by doing that pathway as well. How do we do that? So there's a, multiple number of ways of doing that. We can change our DO set points. We could run a feed forward or feedback loop, could change the whole control setup. We can change our recycles and we can alter our sludge age or our solids uh, uh, processing performance as well. So those are, those are a bunch of optimization uh, opportunities that we might run with that calibrated model. So in real life, um, it might be an ammonia feedback loop. So that second re zone, you might put an ammonia probe in there and try and control the ammonia in that tank and control your aeration input in that tank to try and elevate your ammonia numbers a little bit. So then we force that pathway of that short circuit nitrogen um, removal pathway. Um, we can also look at feed forward control. So we might have a COD analyzer on there and look at our fractionation coming into the plant in real time. And we might have ammonia as well to look at our nitrogen mass coming into the plant in real time and run our aeration demand and our recycles based on that, that input. Um, further to that, we might also look at adding some calculators. So if we're looking at um, process performance, you might find somewhere about 60, 65% of your overall OPEX cost um, outside of the number of operators you have will be in your aeration system. Um, so having your aeration system work as efficiently as you humanly can, um, it will save you quite a little money. Um, the other portion of key uh, portion of your cost is obviously around your dewatering. So we might look at um, doing an online mass balance around your dewatering equipment. So uh, flow in, um, polymer dose in, um, concentration in, and then often your filtrate or your centrate line is where the most easiest place to put an instrument on to measure your flow and load in your return streams um, to, to enable a mass balance around that unit. So uh, thanks, Steve. So what I've done here is an example 
um, whereby, um, and a fairly simplistic example, um, so whereby I've started running the plant uh, at a DO level of maybe two milligrams per litre. And so I've run that for a, a number of days. And then all I've done is I switched the DO down and looked at my performance of the process. Am I, am I getting, am I still compliant firstly on the left-hand side? So ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. Um, and then what effect does that have on my cost to treat? So um, firstly, that will come out in my aeration. So you can quite quickly see that just simply running at lower DO level uh, it means that I have much lower aeration input requirement. So um, that's what gone from 100,000 cubic metres an hour down to 70,000 cubic metres, so 30% less air at peak. Um, so, and then you can see that coming out in my cost profile. So alongside that, we've done a lot of work looking at uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, as well and trying to work through what effect that optimization may have on the production of greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, and there's some very smart people in the likes of University of Queensland, Lou Yi is probably uh, uh, at the forefront of this work uh, globally in terms of monitoring for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but from everything, all the work that we've done around different processes with different control configurations, it looks like as we optimize our process, uh, in general, we end up with, with fewer uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So um, in Australia, particularly, we have quite tight license limits compared to many other places in the world. Um, so if we're getting nitrogen down to low levels, it makes sense to try and optimise your process and to try and use as little air as you possibly can. Um, and I would advise going more towards ammonia-based control because it's more like measuring your heart rate rather than how hard you're breathing for a direct measurement. Um, but it's, it, it, if we're starting to reduce our nitrogen numbers because we have to from a compliance perspective, we might as well be operating that process as efficiently as possible because it costs us less, reduce less, house, less greenhouse gas emissions, and we get better process outcomes from a compliance perspective. Um, I haven't put phosphorus in there, but as well, you know, if you're using your carbon more efficiently, it's also a means of being able to remove phosphorus biologically as well, because you've got more carbon left over to do other things. And that might also be sending some carbon across to a biosolid stream. And as we move more towards product recovery, circular economy, uh, biogas production, things like pyrolysis and, and gasification, um, if you can use your carbon efficiently through your process, you can create more product on that biosolid stream as well, be that gas or uh, char or syngas. So I think I've ranted for long enough. I think that's it, Steve. I bored myself. No, so, no, not at all. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Richard. Um, we just, uh, we might just, uh, from our perspective, Hydra Terra's, we just want to have a quick talk about probably optimization of that environmental monitoring through remote monitoring as well. Um, we've been involved with uh, for a number of years, 20 years in, in monitoring and environmental compliance for wastewater. And most recently uh, we've accelerated our uh, and improved our capabilities um, through remote monitoring. And, and there's a number of, um, on, the, on the effluent side, there's a number of benefits to um, uh, remote IOT or industrial OT monitoring and automation. Um, and we some of the ones we, we've highlighted here is it gives you immediate insight. So it provides real-time da data and, and it allows for immediate insights into the performance of the system equipment. So it helps you make timely decisions and corrective actions. It also um, gives early problem detection. So detect issues or failures early with reducing downtime. And these are significant costs in those and, and productivity impacts. It's a no-brainer, the, the cost savings. So, you know, by preventing equipment breakdown, optimising energy use and reducing the need for online inspections, uh, sampling programs. Uh, our people are now our most expensive asset. 
Um, and our and our work in the past on um, remote monitoring has saved some of our clients millions of dollars. Uh, oh and s and this is another people issue. So reduce the reduce the need for physical presence, which is um, useful environments which are hazarded, uh, hazardous, inaccessible, distance or or distant or remote. Um, wastewater uh, plants are one of those. You know, regulatory compliance. You know, it really facilitates the compliance and makes that easier by continue continually monitoring, recording relevant data. Um, and the other part of that is also that IoT lightweight automation, which is you know the starting of pump valves, irrigation, but you know on variables such as water quality, soil moisture levels, um, and you can do this by you know at a low cost base via remote low power and low cost IT sensors and controllers, you know, and it has that ability to um, allow operators to automatically uh, or manually adjust or perform actions without physical presence. A couple of uh, our solutions that we've been involved in the past, especially what we're dealing with now, is some modular IoT systems. Um, things like you know satellites, uh, battery powered, low low latency IoT, almost instantaneous um, uh, measurement and control. Uh, continuous water quality stations as the technology is advancing and becoming low cost all the time. Uh, we've got a, one a couple of probes on the side. One's a multi probe, which a lot of people are familiar with. But you know, some of the technology is advancing that quickly. We have one up there that we distribute. That's a uh, first time I've I've been involved with it is with a no calibration PC and and salinity probe, so they can be left in situ for long periods of time. And and you know it's going through to the looking at. Um, Pump control, valve controls, irrigation control, and scheduling. Um, those, the, these are improve efficiency and reduce costs. Um, Richard talked about, you know, auto uh, sampling and you know those remote auto sampling, so you're collecting the right data at the right time as well. Uh, we'll look at some questions and answers now. We've um, we have uh, some early bird questions to start with, and we have another one Q and A question. So I might start, I'll just read it out for uh, Richard. Uh, but what were the most difficult emissions to calculate? Yeah, sure. Question. That's a really good question. I'm um, doing quite a lot of work at this moment as well. So um, so IWA has a, a manual on the quantification and modelling of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that's a free, free publication. So if anyone's interested in that, it's um, free to download off the IWA website. A lot of that work, as I said, has been done by Lu Yi and co um, in um, UQ as well in terms of emissions monitoring. Liquid phase monitoring is probably the most mature at the moment in terms of understanding what's happening in the liquid phase. And, and by liquid phase, I mean your aerobic and anoxic and anaerobic zones and your with your mixed liquor sitting in it. So that's that's where we're probably most mature. On the solid stream side of things, we have um, the UK has some good information around um, leakage from digesters and from downstream uh, monitoring around methane um, leakage um, as well. And um, certainly in Denmark, they're looking at taxing greenhouse gas emissions. So they've got a fairly good understanding of their solid stream. But I would say anything to do with dewatering, solid storage, uh, particularly like sludge drying pans, et cetera, or sludge stockpiles, um, we have very limited understanding uh, at this stage. So that's the hardest part to calculate. We don't really have much monitoring for it. Uh, question two, is there any open source global data sets that presents uh, GHGs as updated tables? Yeah. Good question. Uh, again, so you um, that IWA manual is the place to go to, um, and they've started to break down um, the data sets by process unit as well. Um, UK the WIR has some good information, um, and then there's obviously the um, uh, the the downside, I guess, of the end use data at the moment is it's pretty standard uh, and quite um, global information so um that that's probably uh 
if you're looking for updated tables, I'd, I'd go to IWA. Um, there is um, some monitoring protocols that have been developed in um, the UK and now New Zealand as well. Um, I know David de Haas was involved in that of GHD um, so uh, as well. Um, and some of my old colleagues at Mount McDonald um, in New Zealand have been involved in setting that up. So that's another good resource. Right. Thanks, mate. Uh, there's uh, one question Q&A, um, which uh, you said, uh, great presentation. Uh, nice. Will a copy of the slides be circulated? Um, look, we're, we are generally, I, we, not to everybody, but if you get in contact with us or Richard, um, I'm sure we're more than happy um, to provide you with the slides. Um, and so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Richard. Um, thank you. Very, very interesting. You're not, you can see when people are very knowledgeable, very passionate about what they do, and it's great to see. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, and you, you, you indicated, you know, you're waffling on and getting over complex, but you know, my background is environmental science and I followed along very well and it was very interested. So really appreciate your time. The simple way you simplified it. Um, it, it's a very interesting topic and, and I'm with lots and lots of people are interested in. So I appreciate that. Um, if you want to get in contact with myself, you have our direct email addresses up there. Uh, Richard's, uh, also email addresses there. Failing all that, um, give us a call at Hydra Terra and we'll make sure we get that, that uh, bits and pieces out to you or, or forward on the questions to Richard. Um, but yeah, feel free to contact Richard directly as well about about what he spoke about or any, any, any other bits and pieces as well. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time for attending and I'll see you next one.